Hello and welcome to the Intern Tutor Training for 2021 by the South African Pharmacy Council. This podcast aims to provide insight and guidance on how you can fulfill all of the requirements by the South African Pharmacy Council to successfully complete the intern portfolio on the CPD system. Good luck. Before we begin, here's an outline on what is um, what will be covered during this podcast. You will, at the end of the podcast, be able to understand what a competency standard is, how to select a domain, selecting a competency standard, what is the CPD cycle, what is the evidence, examples of evidence, what is the assessment, what is types of feedback that you would expect from the assessor, the reassessment, professionalism, confidentiality, the role of the tutor, and challenging competency standards that you may come across. Although this podcast is aimed at interns, it does provide insight and guidance for your tutors as well. The important resources that you require before we begin, and also during your process of fulfilling your CPDs, You need to have access to the 2021 Intern and Tutor Manual, which is available on the SAPC website. It is a comprehensive document that provides all of the relevant information required for you to successfully fulfill your CPDs. In the manual, you will come across the criteria for assessment of a CPD entry. Now, it's important that you understand the grid as to it will give you insight as to how we, as the assessors or the moderators, mark your CPDs. This is found on page 33 of your manual. The next checklist that you need to look for is a CPD portfolio checklist, which is on page 38 of your manual. Here, it also gives you further guidance on what is expected from you when you are fulfilling your CPDs. And lastly, the competency standards for pharmacists, which will be available on page 62 of your manual and gives you all of the domains that you need to look at. The other resources that could be valuable to you is information from your tutor or guidance from your tutor and other information that may be available on the SAPC website. So in terms of a competency framework, what is a competency framework? Please take a few minutes to familiarize yourself with the competency framework found found in your manual under Annex to B. So a competency framework Competency framework consists of six domains and a number of competencies suitable for this in the South African context was developed. A domain represents an organized cluster of competencies within a framework and the domains with the associated competencies are summarized in table one in your manual. As pharmacists, we know that we practice in a variety of practice settings and each professional must evaluate whether or not a specific standard applies to their practice. The 2018 competency standards for pharmacists were taken into consideration the various processes of development and are applicable when a person is registered as a pharmacist and able to practice independently. The competency standards have been developed with three levels of behavioral statements linked to each competency in order to guide pharmacists in progressing from one level of practice to another. The three levels are entry level into practice, which is three years, the first three years of practice, intermediate practice, and which is generally between three to seven, and finally advanced practice, which is more than seven years. These and more, in, this and more information is available in your manual. So let's get into the terminology. What is a domain? What is a behavioral statement? And what is a competency standard? So in your manual, you will see that we have six domains. Domains are organized clusters of competencies. In these six domains, we have public health, safe and rational use of medicines and medical devices, supply of medicines and medical devices, organizational and management skills, professional and personal practice, education, critical analysis, and research. Within this competency framework, we have, right on the top is the domain. Okay, and as I've mentioned already, we have six domains 
that we have access to. Within this domain, we have a competency standard. And within those competency standards, we have behavioral statements. So a domain will have or can have more than one behavioral statement, as we will discuss later. For example, if you look at the public health domain, which is domain number one, competency standard 1.1 is the promotion of health and wellness. Under health and wellness, we have four behavioral statements. These are provide advice on health promotion, provide advice on disease prevention and control, provide advice on healthy lifestyles, and D, your last one, is participate in public health campaigns. If you look at competency standard 1.2 within domain one, which is medicines information, which is your competency standard, here we see we have also four behavioral statements, and you can have a look at your manual to gain more insight. Furthermore, we have domain one, which is public health, going all the way into 1.6. So it means that we have six competency standards within domain one and various behavioral statements under each competency standard. So here's an example. Have a look at your intern manual as an exercise for yourself. Competency standard 2.6, which is pharmacist initiated therapy. So pharmacist initiated therapy is your competency standard and it comes from domain two. And domain two, the domain says it's safe and rational use of medicines and medical devices. And before I continue further, please make a note that under each domain, you will have in your manual, you will have an introduction. So firstly, it'll say, does this domain apply to me? You'll have an introduction, capability and outcomes. Please make sure you read through this introduction and capability and outcomes as it provides further information for you to understand what exactly is required within that particular domain. So going back to the slide, you will see that competency 2.6 has four behavioral statements from A to D. The structure of the competency standards, we have a domain which is public health going back to one. Um, as I've said, you have, does this uh, domain apply to me? The domain applies to all pharmacists whose practice includes promotion of health and wellness through the provision of healthcare information and education to the public and other members of the healthcare team. There's an introduction which gives you a brief overview of what the domain is all about. And furthermore, it gives you capabilities and outcomes, which is not here, but it's in your manual. So make sure you read read through that. It gives you better insight as to what is required for each of the domains. Continu continuing professional development, CPD. So what is CPD? What is continuous professional development? The definition is that it's a process which, by which registered persons maintain and enhance their competence throughout their professional careers. So basically it means that there's ongoing learning encompasses a range of activities, including continuing education and supplementary training. The CPD enables a registered persons to develop in their area of practice and demonstrate competence. Remember, we, we, we are part of a profession that is dynamic and ever-changing. So in order to remain competent, you need to be able to be current and access information or be aware of the most recent information on whichever aspect of pharmacy you belong to. CPD is a cyclical or cyclical activity. There are four processes in the CPD cycle. We have reflection, planning, implementation, and evaluation. So in the reflection process, what happens? Here, you would have to sit back and think, so what do I need to know and learn to do? So as an intern, fresh out of university, there are multiple things that you are unfamiliar with. Although you have the theory, the practice may be 
um, difficult. So in order for you to fulfill your requirements, you need to sit back and reflect and think, so what is it that I need to know or learn how to do? So when we look at reflection, you need to decide on an appropriate learning title. The title must be relevant to what you need to learn. So make sure it is personal and reflects what you need to learn. Don't just simply copy the word from the competency standard. Here you will immediately receive a zero for the learning title. If one copies exactly what the competency standard states, it becomes immediately a not yet competent. The learning title must be unique and describe your case study. Remember, you want to show or reflect to the assessor and the moderator exactly what you are, what are you um, going to achieve during this competency or CPD by summarizing it in your title. So in, during the reflection process, the first thing you ask yourself is, what do I need to learn? So you need to own your learning need. What is it that you need to learn? What is it that you came across during your practice that you realize that you're unfamiliar with and you need to be able to achieve and become competent in? How do I know that that's what I need to learn? So during your practice, what is it that you came across that you realize you don't know and how do you know? How did you figure out that maybe you didn't understand this particular aspect or you needed more information or you needed to learn more um, legislation, for example? Or, for example, you didn't know a particular um, GPP requirement. How did you know that that's what you needed to learn? And then what will I do with what I've learned? So now that you've gained the information, what are you going to do? How is it going to change your practice, for example? Describing this learning need, make it a personal reflection. So make sure you use the personal pronoun I. Be careful not to describe the learning need of the patient, but rather what your learning need is. What are you willing to going to achieve during this CPD? Please note that the learning need must be related to the selected outcome. So when we say outcome, we mean based on what that domain at large explains what the behavioral or behavior states or the competency states and the behavioral statements that follow. So whatever you decide to reflect on must align to the behavioral statements within that competency standard. So here's a reflection checklist. And this, as I said before, is on page 32, 38 of your manual. So during your during your reflection process, have this checklist nearby. So you need to ask yourself, is there a title that is relevant to your learning need? Is it um, descriptive of what you're going to achieve? Is it um, a replication of the domain or the competency standard or any of the behaviors? And if, if so, make sure that it's not. You want to be able to check that the, the title is short, specific, and related to the competency standard. Is the title a concise statement in your own words of, um, of what your learning need is? In the reflection, you have you clearly stated what you need to know or learn? Have you stated your learning need in the first person? If, for example, I need to know or I need to learn. Have you stated why you have identified this learning need for yourself and not just stated that it is a required outcome? And have you made sure not to include details of planning and implementation here? So remember your reflection gives you, gives your assessor or the moderator a window into what you're thinking and what your reasoning behind choosing this particular competency standard. The second step in the CPD cycle is planning. And as the name suggests, what is your plan? How can I learn this? So how are you going to, or what is your plan? What is your plan on achieving what you set out to do? So based on your reflection, how are you going to achieve that reflection? 
and planning gives the assessor and the moderator insight into what you're thinking and your reasoning behind how you're going to achieve that particular learning need. So in your planning, what is important is not to only describe how you plan to proceed, but to say what you're going to do, how you are going to do it, why are you going to do things this way, and when you are going to do it. So how exactly am I going to learn this particular aspect or how I'm going to achieve this particular learning need? And what are my options? Refer to the behavioral statement and structure your planning accordingly. So each of the behavioral statements under the competency standards is actually a guide for you on how to achieve that competency standard. If you are able to align your planning as per each of the behavioral statements, it gives you a systematic approach on how you're going to achieve your learning need. Mentioned relevant resources to be used. So when we say relevant resources, what are the resources that you would search for in order to achieve your learning need? So for example, if you want to, um, if your competency is based on achieving a particular legislation, you would have to look at the Medicines Act 101 of 1965, or you would look at the Good Pharmacy Practice, or would you, you would look at the Pharmacy Act. So those are your relevant resources. Please don't add any irrelevant resources as you would um, lose marks. What evidence can you submit to support this learning activity? And planning is written in future tense. So what will you do? The planning checklist also available on page 38. You um, should have this next to you and ideally go through the list. How have you clearly stated um, what you're going to learn? Have you identified all of the resources that you'll be using? Have you explained how you will be using these resources? Have you made not sure not to just write what you intend to do, which is in implementation? And have you written this in future tense? The third step to the CPD cycle, cycle is implementation. Now implementation is what have you done? As the word states, implement is actually to do. So in implementation, tell the story and keep the personal use of I. Describe what you did actually. So what you actually did during this process of achieving that learning need that you set out in the beginning. So provide the context, what, when, where, how will you achieve this particular learning need? Link this to the evidence. Remember to include all the behavioral statements of the chosen outcome. Implementation is written in the past tense. So what you did and how you did it. So implementation is very important in terms of the CPD cycle and it contains actually the most marks in terms of passing the entire cycle. So your evidence is critical in, in, in implementation and also annotating and including all of your behavioral statements is critical. So make sure that you link all of your information to your evidence in relation to your behavioral statements, but we'll get to that a little bit later. This is your implementation checklist. Make sure you have described exactly what you did. You included where, when, what, and how. Have you written this in the past tense? Have you referred to the labels on your evidence, that is your behavioral statements in the text? And have you checked that what you did matches your learning need? And finally, have you checked that, did you address all of the behavioral statements in the competency standard? Now, often what I find as a moderator is we um, interns often forget to address all of the behavioral statements and also to link the evidence to the behavioral statements. So we'll get to that a little bit later, but just remember that's a critical part to the CPD cycle and it's imperative that you complete this to the best of your ability. 
So what is the evidence checklist? Make sure that you have checked that you have sufficient evidence. And we'll get to sufficiency um, later, but just briefly to cover and to ensure that 75% of your behavioral statements of the competency standard is covered. So what does that mean? That means that if you have um, four behavioral statements under your competency standard, as I've mentioned in 1.1 under domain one, if you have four, you would have to make sure that of those four pieces of behavioral statements, you have covered or provided evidence for at least three of those behavioral statements. So you must show evidence for three of those statements. Have you annotated? We'll get to annotation a little bit later, but annotation is providing a detailed description of what your evidence is actually saying. So when your assessor is looking through the evidence, he or she is aware of exactly what your story is and what, your sto what is the story you are telling. Have you annotated your evidence with the behavioral statements? So make sure you link your behavioral statements to the evidence by annotating it. Don't assume that the assessor or the moderator understands your reasoning behind providing the evidence that you have. As often, we're not sure. We're really not sure where the behavioral statements link to the evidence that you have provided. Is your evidence clear? Is it readable? Is it not loaded upside down? Very important because it becomes very frustrating for the assessor and the moderator to be able to read. Have you made sure that all patient identifying details such as name and surname and ID number have been removed or hidden? So if for some reason you have not done this, you are breaching patient con confidentiality and unfortunately it will be a, a zero. The final step of the CPD cycle is evaluation. So in evaluation, here you describe what you've learned and how you have applied this type um, or this learning. So remember the cycle is now complete. The original part was reflecting on what you needed to learn and, and what initiated or what sparked that need to learn. You're reflecting on that, You're the process of planning, how you're going to achieve that, that learning need that you, that you want to achieve. Um, and then implementation, how you're going to do it, what you did, and then evaluation is reflecting on, um, not reflecting, but basically having a look to explain what you've learned and how are you learning what you've learned in practice on a daily basis. So the focus here is when you look at the learning outcome, what have you learned related to the evidence? The application, how have you subsequently used your acquired knowledge in the relevant settings that you work? Impact, what is the impact or how has your acquired knowledge changed your practice? Identifying of future learning needs. So although you've completed all of this and you've achieved your learning need, what is it that during this process you realized that you did not achieve and you would like to? learn that in the future. Remember in evaluation, it's not what you did. It's about what you've learned and how are you applying this to your current practice. So let me just give you a quick example on evaluation. If we look at competency standard um, 2.6 under domain two, which says patient initiated therapy, so I would assume here you would say um, you didn't know what the process is or your learning need was to understand a little bit more about what over-the-counter medicine was uh, and how to manage a particular patient for, say, example, diarrhea or constipation or a cough. So in your evaluation process, you would say that you have learned now how to manage a patient who has experienced diarrhea and um, what are the questions you would ask from a history taking perspective? Um, how would you record a history? Um, what questions uh, in terms of medication you would ha ask in terms of family history, for example? Are there any other medicines that they're using? Um, you would ask um, if, or you would intervene in terms of um, 
whether the product that you've given is the correct dosage form, for example, um, if the quantity is correct, etc. So you would explain what you've learned during this process. But then maybe potentially you realize during your process that there are certain medicines that are over the counter but are not schedule two medicines. So for example, um, if we look at a drug like methanamic acid, methanamic acid, which is commonly known as Ponstan, can be actually available to your patient as a schedule two. But you need to understand under which circumstances those are, and that would be your next learning need. So that would be an example um, of scenarios or expectations in terms of what you need to learn in future. And how you've practiced over-the-counter medicine in your current setting, you could say how now you understand the process of the questioning you need to ask for diarrhea for your patient. You apply that regularly and you are more okay with understanding the different aspects of diarrhea and what medicines that are available to treat and when you would actually refer your patient. The checklist for evaluation would be, have I clearly stated what, what I've learned from the action? So clearly stating um, how your learning need has been addressed in your evaluation. Have you checked that your learning need matches your, um, your learning matches your learning need, as I've said already? Have you clearly described how this learning has impacted on the way you practice? Have you given a specific example of how, you, how you've applied this learning? Something that you did after the action just has been described. So after you've learned or achieved your learning need. Have you remembered that I, you don't have to provide evidence for this, but you just have to um, describe it? And then lastly, have you noted what your future learning needs are? So that's your, your four-step process in a CPD cycle. It is, um, a, it's, a, it's, it's a cyclical process, as I've mentioned already, and it must be fulfilled for every single um, competency or domain that you, every, every domain that you need to fulfill. So what is the process? What is the stepwise process? Okay, remember the first thing you need to do before you begin this entire CPD cycle as an intern is you have to make sure that you complete your annual declaration first. If you don't complete it, you cannot move forward. So make sure you do that. The first step is to select a domain. So focus on the relevance um, to your particular um, practice setting, be it in a community pharmacy or hospital pharmacy, wherever it may be. Next, you select a competency also relevant to your learning need. So ideally you should be selecting your competency based on what you already know that you need to learn. So it shouldn't be a process of selecting a competency first, but it should actually be identifying your learning need first and then selecting the suitable competency standard based on that learning need. Read all of the behavioral statements, start the CPD cycle, which is the four step process, enter and submit online for your tutor verification, the tutor verifies and submits online. Make sure that your tutor has verified and submitted your entries by the deadlines published in the manual and check for feedback thereafter. Okay, just a brief overview again. So once you've chosen a competency standard, um, check again that it is appropriate in terms of your practice setting. So you cannot choose um, a competency that is not relevant to your setting. So off the top of my head, for example, if you work in a community pharmacy, you cannot select a competency that deals with line clearance in manufacturing, for example. Read all of the behavioral state statements carefully. Decide on the evidence. At least 75% of the behavioral statements must be covered and follow through. As you complete each of the phases of the CPD cycle, make sure that you write what is relevant to that chosen outcome. Remember your checklist is there to um, 
provide guidance. So always have it accessible on hand next to you when you are fulfilling this process. So what are the requirements? As an intern, you need to submit six CPD entries. Each entry must be accompanied by suitable evidence. So each of these six, six CPD entries, one from each domain, you must be successful in all six CPD entries in order to be deemed competent. For domain five, it is compulsory to do competency 5.3. So this is very important. Of the six CPD entries, you have a choice between choosing any of the um, competency standards in any of the other five domains. However, in domain five, it is compulsory that you do competency standard 5.3. You cannot choose any of the other competency standards. You must choose 5.3. So that's a very important point to remember. For each domain, choose one competency. So read all the behavioral statements carefully. Remember, it must align to your learning need. One to three behavioral st statements require that you provide evidence for all of those statements. So it must be 100% evidence for all of those statements. So if you look at page 76 in your intern manual, 4.4 quality assurance, that particular competency standard has three behavioral statements, A, B, C. So in a scenario like that, you have to make sure that you provide evidence for all three of the statements. So any of the behaviors that contain three and three statements and less. So if it has one statement, you have to obviously provide evidence for all of it. If you have two, again, evidence for all of those two behavioral statements, and the same applies for three. So anything three and less, you provide 100% evidence. If there are four greater than and equal to four behavioral statements, you provide evidence for at least 75% of those. So if your statement, um, sorry, if your competency standard has four statements, you would provide evidence for three of those behavioral statements, as I've said before. So consult your manual for details of the behavioral statements. Every CPD must reflect individual work and no group activities are accepted. Very important point because we see a lot of activities are done as group exercises. So they will not be accepted and you will be given a zero. Okay, so this is an example of um, what is required. So if you look at competency standard 1.3, which is professional and health advocacy, we have behavioral statements A and B you must provide evidence for both A and B. In competency standard 1.1, we have promotion of health and wellness. Here you have behavioral statements A, B, C, D. So you need to provide evidence for three quarters of that four statements. So you'd have to provide three pieces of evidence, which um, equates to 75%. So what is the evidence criteria? Now this is very important. So um, here we, I cannot emphasize that you need to fulfill all of the requirements when it comes to your evidence. So you must make sure that your evidence is annotated, that it is current, meaning that it is in the year of your internship. It must be valid, so relevant to all of the behavioral statements that you are trying to fulfill. It must be authentic. It must be sufficient. Okay, sufficiency meaning you must uh, fulfill that 75% rule if it is, if the behavioral statements in that competency standard is four or more. So annotation, what is annotation? Um, over the years of being an assessor and a moderator, I've noticed that annotation is, is quite a struggle for most interns. And it's critical in, in telling your story as to how you have achieved your competency by providing evidence that is clearly annotated. So what is annotation? Annotation is a mechanism to give meaning to the evidence that you have provided. It justifies why that particular piece of evidence was included. It must be planned and it must be meaningful. And it must provide links to all of the behavioral statements that you have 
under your competency standard. What annotation is not, it's not merely labeling um, your evidence. It's not single words next to parts of evidence. It's not scribbles on evidence. It's not lacking links to, sorry, it is lacking links to behavioral statements. So annotation, as I said, gives the assessor and the moderator a clearer picture on exactly what you're trying to say in your story of proving your competence for that particular domain. So you must tell a story and the story is what have I done to show behavior. Annotation of the date on a prescription. So here's an example of what is good annotation and what really has no value to the assessor or to the moderator. So if you are providing the date and you are annotating the date as potentially applying to one of the behavioral statements in your competency standards where date is an important aspect of proving that you are fulfilling the requirements of that behavioral statement. So if you say the date is 2002-21 and you just say annotate that this is the date of the prescription, it really adds no, no value. So yes, it is the date of the prescription, but what does it mean in terms of the bigger picture, in terms of the legislation um, as a pharmacist? What are the, what, is, what does the Medicine Act say? How does it relate to the Pharmacy Act or the Good Pharmacy Practice, for example? So what good annotation should be is under the date, you would explain for a prescription to be valid, it must be presented for dispensing within one month after it was written. This, prescrip pre this prescription is thus valid. So that goes to the Medicines Related and Substance Act 101 of 1965, which speaks to the validity of a prescription where you are not allowed to dispense a prescription that is more than a month old. Okay, so let's look at the evidence here, annotation of evidence. So this is an example of a of, of an invoice that you've been rec you've received from your wholesaler on the 5th of February 2021. Um, there's the name of the pharmacy on the top there, um, signature of whoever's received it, and it is for trazodone 50 milligram caps. Um, you can see the obviously the date who you've received it from and which pharmacy it's going to. Okay, so how would you annotate this? What, what would be the perfect annotation? And as it is, do you think it is um, evidence that you would provide to your assessor or your moderator as is? Or do you think this is the annotation that your assessor or your moderator would deem as proper and tells your story of what you look for as an intern when you receive stock. So you can see here the intern says name of the pharmacy and just untidily points an arrow there, um, circles the batch number, um, what the medicine was ordered, what the account number is and the date. Do you think this is good evidence? Um, or do you think this is better evidence? Where here we see that it's much more neatly done, it's clearer, um, legible, easier to understand. So we know where the invoice from the wholesaler, we, we know the um, name of the medicine, which wholesaler it's coming from, the batch number, expiry date, the medicine was stored after it was received. Do you think this was good evidence? And then lastly, this piece of evidence, what do you think about this? So you would have a look at this and you'll see right on the top left corner, it says, I checked the name of the pharmacy on the parcel to confirm that it was indeed for the pharmacy that I work at. And then above the UPD and the address, it says competency standard 3.2E, the end phase of the procurement of medicine. Under the name of the drug, it says I check the medicine name, strength, pack size, and price. 
then the batch number says I compared the batch number with the batch number on the parcel to ensure that it is the same. The importance this is important for batch traceability. Expiry date I checked the expiry date to confirm that it is not short dated. I use the expiry date to pack the medicine on the shelf according to the first expiry first out principle. The, the parcel is received in good order. The medicine was not damaged or short dated. The medicine was captured onto the system to update the stock levels. The medicine was stored on the shelf between uh, below 25 degrees in alphabetical order with other schedule five medicines as the standard operating procedure states. So in your opinion, could you tell me which do you think is the best evidence? Um, from all of the four pieces of evidence that I've shown you so far. So I would like you to please um, either um, use, use the QR link to um, access the form, the Microsoft form, or you could just copy and paste the link onto a, Google, onto a tab and it'll take you to the poll. The poll is purely to ask you which pieces of evidence do you think was the best piece of evidence. Okay, so going back to um, evidence, we've, we've seen what annotation means and, and what, what it entails. Um, in terms of evidence being current, so your CPD entry must relate to exposure um, to competency standards during your internship year. So you have to make sure that whatever evidence that you upload is done in the year that you are um, practicing as an intern. Please do not provide evidence in your undergraduate year or other people's evidence as part of your evidence. You will immediately fail. Evidence must therefore be collected during the internship and should not include any other evidence, as I've said already. Okay, validity. So what, what do we mean by valid? Your evidence must pertain to the specific competency being addressed. So remember, based on the competency, if it's, for example, uh, patient information or pharmacist-assisted therapy or initiated therapy, you must make sure all of the evidence is related to that particular competency standard. If the competency is about how to fry an egg and your evidence is how crispy the bacon is, it is really of no value. If factual and or calculation errors occur in the evidence, it's immediately deemed as not valid. So make sure that your calculations are done properly and verified by your tutor before you submit. Any information that is not factual um, and is not relevant to the South African setting will also be deemed invalid. If your evidence is not valid, the other three criteria will not count. So even if it's sufficient, we will not um, accept it. If it's if it's so meaning if it's not if it's current if it is um, sufficient and if it's authentic, we will not accept it if it is not valid. So what does authentic work mean? Authentic means this is purely your work, it's your evidence. You have not copied somebody else's evidence and, and provided it as your own. The evidence must be verified online by your tutor. So make sure your, your, your tutor is aware of all of the information you are submitting. The tutor verification, make sure your tutor verifies your entries and make it your responsibility to check that your tutor has um, verified your evidence. The next one is sufficiency. So what is sufficiency? Sufficiency meaning that in terms of um, the 75% rule, you are fulfilling the requirements. Remember I said, if there are four or more behavioral statements within your competency standard, you have to ensure that you provide 75% of the evidence based on the number of behavioral statements that you have. So if you have four behavioral statements, you would ensure that three of those have evidence related to those behavioral statements. Make sure you have enough evidence and focus on the quality, not on the quantity of evidence. 
The same piece of evidence can't be used for more than one competency standard. So meaning you cannot use the same prescription in another competency standard um, as evidence. Okay, so, so be careful of that. We see that happen quite often. In terms of the pieces of evidence that you can submit um, and what you should do and how you should um, provide this evidence, is important because often we see pages and pages of information that we're really not sure how it's relevant to that particular competency standard. So when you are providing pictures or photographs, make sure you add a date stamp to that photo. It's meaningless otherwise, um, unless it's authenticated and you can identify yourself in the picture because we don't not show who the person is and it could actually be a picture of anybody. Make sure you maintain patient confidentiality by blocking out the face of the patient, or you can actually uh, provide or provide consent that the patient has allowed you to use their photograph. When you are referring to pages from a textbook, for example, the SAMP, reference the name, the edition, the page number, etc. Um, and what does it mean? What are you trying to show in terms of the evidence that you are providing from the textbook? Um, is it really that you're showing us that you can use a scanner or a photocopier? So be very careful. The, it becomes really um, a piece of evidence that the assessor or the moderator has no idea what you're talking about when you're providing just pages and pages of the SAMP. When it comes to delivery notes, like the evidence that I've showed you previously in the annotation exercise, you need to show exactly what it means. So stock was delivered, but received by whom? Signatures, un, uh, signatures not annotated are actually meaningless. So who actually signed it? Um, when did you receive it in, based on the date? You must annotate the date, the batch number, expiry date, etc. and explain why. So why was this important and relevant in terms of showing your competence? What is it checking? Why is it important to check that? Put yourself in the assessor's shoes before submitting evidence. Ask what does it show will probably point to need for more discussion and or annotation. So to sum it up, um, ideally no highly glossy photos. Ideally not uploaded upside down. It makes it difficult for the assessor and the moderator to read. The evidence must be clear and legible. The evidence must be done in one document, ideally. Annotate, annotate, annotate. So we cannot stress enough. Your annotation will provide the story to how you achieved your learning need. It must be linked to the evidence to support a specific behavioral statement. Identify your own signature from the others. And remember the assessor does not know you. So make sure your pictures are well annotated as well um, to reflect who you are in that picture. What kind of evidence? So when it comes to the type of evidence that you provide, um, ask yourself if you're providing information on a patient, is it a prescription? Are you providing evidence to a particular group of people? Is it an attendance register or a presentation? Reference, what were the reference materials that were used and what was the feedback that was given? So when you are providing information about a patient, what is the types of evidence that you would provide based on the patient that you are providing the evidence for? So would a prescription be suitable? Would a, uh, a written, signed declaration by the patient be sufficient? When it comes to groups of people, do you submit the presentation, the attendance register? In terms of the attendance register, who was the presenter? What is the presenter's name? What's the date? When was the date of the presentation and the venue of the presentation? How many presenters presenters were there? Were there just one presenter or many presenters? What was the feedback on the presentation? It should also reflect the knowledge and understanding of the audience after the presentation. It is not a rating of the presenter. So here, in in, in the circumstances of pre presenting information on feedback. You must make sure that you provide evidence that reflects that the audience has understood exactly what the presentation was about. So you would have to have a form 
provide it to your audience, which asks them questions on your presentation to reflect and show the understanding of the audience on whatever topic you have just delivered. Furthermore, when you're consulting with the patient, provide evidence that shows the patient history, the prescription, the request from the patient, um, the blue copy, the label, and the reference material that has been used in terms of consulting your patient. For example, was the stamp used in relation to when consulting the patient? What, uh, what if you were consulting a doctor? Provide the reasons behind consulting the doctor provide the prescription that is relevant to the consultation with the doctor, and what was the reference material that you used in order to substantiate consulting the doctor, if it may be potentially due to the dosage that was incorrect on the script or the wrong drug, for example, what reference did you use in order to substantiate this information to the doctor? The references must be scientific and not Wikipedia. It must be well annotated to tell your story, and it must include the page, the edition of that particular reference material. For example, if you're providing evidence from the SAMP, it must show which page it was, which edition of the SAMP it was, and annotate on the evidence that you provided exactly where you have obtained that information from. The other pieces of evidence that you can provide is sometimes you may attend a meeting. So the types of evidence you would like to provide here to support that you have attended the meeting is the agenda to the meeting, the attendance register, the minutes to that meeting, and very importantly, how did you contribute as an intern to that particular meeting? What did you, um, how did you add value to that meeting? The other pieces of evidence is working with data. So in terms of data, the evidence that you would support this by providing um, the reasons for data collection, so example, a screening report or some sort of data analysis. So the evidence checklist that you need to make sure that you cover is, have you checked that you have sufficient evidence? So have you covered 75% of the evidence, provided it is four or more behavioral statements within that competency standard? Remember, if it is three or less, you need to provide evidence for all three of those behavioral statements. Have you annotated your evidence clearly and provides a clear story to the assessor and the moder moderator as to why you have included that piece of evidence? Have you annotate annotated your evidence with the behavioral statements and does this match the behavioral statements mentioned under your implementation? So just remember that's very important. Your evidence must speak to the information that is provided in your implementation section. Link the behavioral statements in your implementation to the behavioral statements in your evidence by annotating it clearly. Is your evidence clear? Is it readable? Is it not ups loaded upside down, etc.? Have you made sure that all of the information that identifies patients have been removed, such as the name, the surname, and the ID number of the patient? So in summary, what we see with evidence is that evidence is proof of what you did. It supports your story. It provides um, a picture as to how you achieved your particular learning need for that competency standard. You're not really just merely reading an article or not theor providing a theoretical scenario, not witnessing someone else. Um, it is your evidence, it is relevant to what you have done and provides a clear story or a clear picture for the assessor and the moderator. You must be able to convince the assessor that you have performed that particular activity. It must be professional, you must be provide evidence that is neat and clear and legible. Um, pro make sure that it's not a note scribbled on a prescription. So. In summary, you know, your evidence needs to be something that you should be proud of to submit to the assessor and the moderator. So the moderator and, and the assessor understands exactly what you're trying to achieve in terms of achieving that particular learning need. Okay, so let's provide an example of what a CT CPD entry looks like. Okay, so you were asked as an intern to participate in a public health campaign. 
So which is the relevant competency standard that you would choose? And looking through all of the domains, you find that competency standard 1.1 is relevant to participating in a public health campaign. So here you would see this is domain one, public health 1.1 is a competency and it says promotion of health and wellness. And the behavioral statement says, a person who has achieved this standard is able to demonstrate the following behaviors. Provide advice on health promotion, provide advice on disease prevention and control, provide advice on healthy lifestyles, and participate in public health campaigns. Now immediately by looking at this, you want to achieve this outcome by showing the assessor and the moderator how you've achieved in um, promoting health and wellness within the institution that you work at. Also, if you look at the behavioral statements, there are four behavioral statements, and immediately you should know that you need to achieve 75% of those behavioral statements in terms of your evidence. So you would have to find or provide evidence for three of those behaviors. So reflection, what would you state in your reflection? Your learning title is the first thing that you would look at. And what does your learning title mean? Remember, if we, um, when we discussed learning title, it must not be a copy and paste from the competency standard. So if you look at this learning title, it says participation in COVID-19 health campaign at Steve Beagle Academic Hospital. So immediately the assessor knows that you are participating in a health campaign around COVID-19. So what was the reason that triggered this type of learning and why is it important that you need to do this? So my pharmacy manager asked me to participate in a COVID-19 health campaign and I did not know what this entailed. The learning needs, I need to learn how to provide advice and participate in a public health campaign. So make a note of what the learning need is. The learning need is for, for you to learn how to provide evidence, uh, sorry, advice and participate in a public health campaign, which is in this scenario, COVID-19. It's not learning about COVID-19, it's learning how to provide advice and participate. So here the learning need in terms of the domain is to teach you how to, or to expect you to learn how to deliver any information, be it on any health topic. Um, how would you gather information and provide advice and participate in that campaign, irrespective of what the topic is? What do I hope to achieve? I hope to be familiar with the steps required to plan and successfully participate in a public health campaign. My apologies, so in terms of planning, you have to look at um, what, what does it entail uh, in relation to planning, have your checklist at hand. So here you plan to make a poster using relevant, which is valid, current, authentic, and sufficient resources, such as the National Department of Health and World Health Organization policies and guidelines, and the SAPC website. You will include information on health promotion, healthy lifestyles and disease, pre disease prevention and control. So that comes straight from your behavioral statements. You verify the poster with your tutor, you use the poster in your health campaigns, you get feedback from the audience that you have delivered the information to via uh, an attendance register. And also you can provide a um, information um, form where you request um, the knowledge that they have received and that they have understood that particular presentation that you have delivered. Obtain the participation letter, which I've said, and, and you plan to participate in the COVID-19 screening using the screening tool. So explain what the screening tool is and how that works. I did all of this in order to be able to participate in a public health campaign. So note that all of the resources are scientific resources that we would all um, use in order to get information on COVID-19. And you can see that it, it relates to all of the behavioral statements within 1.1. Implementation, you consulted the following resources, National Department of Health, Evidence A 1.1, which relates to behavioral statement 1.1A and World Health Policies and Guidelines, Evidence 1.1b, and SAPC website, Evidence 1.1c. I formulated the poster to use in the campaign, Evidence D, 1.1a to C. So it covers those 
behavioral statements, but your evidence is, is titled Evidence D. I presented the poster at the COVID-19 screening area at the entrance of the hospital. Evidence E, attendance register maintaining patient confidentiality. So remove details of the patients off your attendance register. I did the screening using the screening tool where you provide the evidence of the screening tool, evidence F, 1.1D. I received the feedback from my supervisor and obtained the letter of participation from the health and safety manager, evidence G, which is 1.1D. Now, what we haven't mentioned here is you can also provide evidence that um, there was understanding. Although it does not cover any of the competency standards, you can actually provide it if you wish to, but provided that you fulfill all of the behavioral statements mentioned above. Examples of possible evidence for 1.1, source documents, um, which specify health, education, tools, um, so your source documents would be your National Department of Health, the World Health Organization guidelines, etc. The tools that the, uh, you would use would be the detailed poster or maybe a pamphlet or the presentation. You can provide evidence. Letter of participation highlighting what your role was in the, in the program. Attendance register maintaining patient confidentiality. And where does it fit in, ab in above? How many behavioral statements are covered in terms of the evidence? Remember, 1.1 is 4, so you would have to have 75% of the evidence available to be deemed competent. Evaluation. I learned how to provide advice and participate in public health campaigns. I subsequently participated in a diabetic screening day. I would like to learn more on providing advice to other healthcare workers. I am more aware of public health issues. I am now more confident to volunteer to participate in public health campaigns. So here you can see you are demonstrating what you've learned in terms of I learned how to provide advice, um, what, how you've used or demonstrated the skill that you've learned in the recent past, what would you like to learn in the future, so you'd like to provide advice uh, more aware of pu other public health issues in the future. And you say that you are confident. So these are all related to the checklist that is provided in your manual, so make sure you have that close by. In terms of the assessment, so how do we as assessors and moderators have a look at your CPD and how do we gauge whether we give you a zero, one, two, or three? So if you look at the, the grid that is available in your, in your manual, which I spoke about right at the beginning on page 33, it provides, with, it provides you with a detailed explanation as to how you would, uh, how we assess you as an intern. So the scale that we use is on a scale of zero to three to earn three marks all requirements must be met. So you must be fulfilling all of the requirements. Follow the assessment criteria for each of the four phases of the CPD cycle, which is on page 33 of your manual, which gives you a clear guideline as to when you would get a one and when would you get a zero, etc. In addition, you must, you must use an appropriate uh, communication style. It must be professional. Um, your grammar must be correct, your spelling errors um, should not be there, should be properly punctuated, trade names must be ca capitalized. So make sure that the style in which you write must be professional. Remember in, uh, on the program on the SAPC website, uh, spelling and grammatical errors are not autocorrected, so make sure that you check all of this before you submit. Remember to check the manual on page 29 to 30 for full details of how 0, 1, 2, and 3 uh, are allocated to you. Okay, my apologies, it's not page 29 to 30, it's actually page 30, 33 all the way down to 35. So just look out for those pages in your manual and it really does give you a clear description of how we assess and that's the assessment grid we use in order to um, give you a zero, one or two or three. 
So make sure you understand exactly how that grid works and fulfill all of those requirements. Okay, and this is the example of the assessment grid on page 33. Um, so you'll see it's very descriptive. It provides uh, clear instructions as to when you would get a three and when you would get a zero based on each of the steps within the CPD cycle, reflection, planning, implementation, and evaluation. Okay, so in terms of the feedback from your assessors, what can you expect? The comments um, that would be provided are dated, um, so you know exactly when the comments were, were stated. The reason why we do this is because often we have interns where we're unhappy with the content that has provided, so sometimes it goes back and forth quite a few times before we are all happy. Um, we do give you positive feedback where we acknowledge that you are actually on the right track and we give you negative feedback in terms of providing you pointers as to giving you direction as to where you went wrong and how you can improve. Especially in terms of evidence and annotation, I think that is one of the most commonly uh, or common problematic areas when we're marking CPDs where we find that evidence is not annotated. The comments um, are purely guidelines for the next entries, even if um, the att attached entry is assessed and is competent. So what we're trying to say there is make sure, even though you are competent within a CPD, make sure you go back and have a look at the comments provided by the assessors or the moderators in order to guide you as to what the next step is in terms of the other CPDs that you are going to fulfill. Reassessment, you are allowed to resubmit for reassessment of your CPD entries. On reassessment, make, make sure that you are fixing an entry that is there. Don't start a new one unless the assessor recommends this. And if necessary, remove incorrect evidence. To minimize the need for resubmission, submit early and submit regularly on a monthly basis. See all the guidelines in your manual in, in relation to the conditions, the application procedure, and the timelines that are required in terms of reassessment. To prevent the need for resubmission, make sure to follow your assessor's recommendations as they provide clear direction as to where, the, the, where you have gone wrong. Resubmitted CPD entries are sent to the same assessor. Don't simply resubmit without attending to the reasons for the entry being deemed not yet competent. It becomes very frustrating when the intern does not rectify all of the problems that we've um, identified and automatically it becomes a failed CPD. You are allowed to submit nine CPD entries, but in order to be deemed competent, you have to get six and you have to have 50%. A fee is levied if 10 or more entries have been submitted on your reassessment. Professionalism is very important. We are all um, in the pharmacy profession, and I think um, no matter which profession you are, um, providing a, um, it's a responsibility, I think, in terms of how you um, project yourself when you're writing. So make sure there is no plagiarism. Make sure you're not copying um, verbatim from another person or from a, from a scientific resource, for example. Your CPD entries must reflect your own work. Um, any irregularities, irregularities will be referred to the SAPC legal department and penalties will be actioned. And expect them to be applied and expect them to be severe. So we have come across over the years where interns have um, taken entries from previous years or taken entries from their undergraduate years. Remember, it's um, the assessors are a large pool of assessors who come from very different backgrounds and are able to pick up any plagiarisms or copying. CBD submissions are more than just another hurdle. They're an opportunity for you to develop yourself professionally. Confidentiality is very important. Uh, it must be maintained at all times, be it on prescriptions, be it on trailer labels, Schedule 6 registers, for example. Make sure that the name is completely obscured and tidy scribbles are not effective like the one we see below. So make sure that it is not visible at all um, because when confidentiality is breached, you get an immediate zero. 
Confidentiality applies only to patients, not to doctors, hospitals, or other facilities, not to staff, attendants, registers either. Be careful not to blank out all of your evidence. Kids, you want to be able to provide evidence that is uh, legible to your assessor and your moderator so they understand exactly what you are trying to achieve. So what is the role of the tutor? The tutor is there to provide guidance to the intern to help them through the process of achieving all of their competencies within the CPDs. They um, remember in terms of the tutor, they also have to do their annual de declaration and provide six CPD activities. The role they, uh, the tutor, is seen as a role model, implies an obligation to be competent and practice professionally at all times. They seem to be a mentor, opportunity for self-development through training, and you can use this for your own CPD entries. So being a tutor for, a, for an intern can actually benefit the tutor whereby they could use these entries in their own CPDs. Tutor verification is very important. If it's not verified, this, the submission will not go through to be assessed. So they, uh, as a tutor, you need to make sure that you evaluate the entire CPD entry. Make sure that all elements of authentication are present. Very important is that when the intern completes an entry, you must verify it online. Either accept, um, will release entry to the council, or suggest to intern how to improve that entry then verify and release. Assist the intern with assessor comments after the assessment as well. Remember to always double check on calculations. Often we find um, you know, calculations are incorrect and immediately the CPD entry is deemed um, as a zero incompetent. The role of the tutor is the ultimate responsibility for completion of internship requirements lies with the intern, however, the tutor is there to guide the intern through the entire process. You have a responsibility to familiarize yourself with the entire internship requirements and to timelessly complete all of the reports that are required. You, are, you play a very important role um, as no intern is likely to su succeed without a tutor and we're really thankful and grateful for all of your effort that you put into assisting our interns to become successful pharmacists of the future. The tutor must be competent, gives guidance, uh, be interactive, show empathy, and be supportive as well. Always remember that you, um, you grow together and you and your intern can actually learn from each other, particularly now with CPDs being online. Um, it's a process where you can share information together. So just enjoy the, the journey. In terms of how you can benefit here, think about domain six, which includes education. So tutors can use the opportunity to complete their own CPDs by providing education to their intern. So some of the challenging competency standards that we come across um, and to bear in mind, challenging or carefully considered uh, before you actually attempt them is 1.3, 1.4, 2.7, 2.8, 3.3, 3.5, um, and then 4.1 to 4.5, uh, except for 4.4, 6.1, 6.4, 6.5, and 6.8. In terms of um, competency standards that are specific to a specific sector, we would you see that 3.1 is only suitable for interns in the manufacturing sector and 6.3 is only specific to academic interns. The competency standard that is not suitable for interns at all is 6.7. So as finally, I hope you enjoy your journey as an intern through the process of CPD. As you know, um, as a pharmacist in the future or pharmacist of the future, CPDs is an ongoing process that you would have to do throughout your career. So enjoy the process, learn, experience, um, develop yourself, um, be successful in whatever you do, and become a true lifelong learner. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. I hope it, it was enjoyable and I hope you 
have learned something new and I wish you all this, the best for your internship year with many successes ahead of you. Thank you. This is the contact information if you require it at any point in time.